Well, after making these videos for over a year, we're finally getting around to a mainline Mario game. And when looking at the science behind the Mario games, there are so many aspects of the series that we can look at in terms of their physics, biology and chemistry. But today, we're taking a look at Mario's most iconic power-up. Hello everybody and welcome back to the Science of, where today we're taking a look at the science behind Mario's Fire Flower. But before we begin today's video, I'd just like to say that if you enjoy it, then make sure you leave a like, subscribe and click the bell to keep up to date on the Science of, and see more of the real world science involved in your favourite games, shows and more. And then, if you want to see me play the games I discuss on the channel, then check out my streams over on twitch.tv slash togglejam. But for now, let's get back to Mario. Seeing as we're looking at the Fire Flower, we're going to start by jumping back to 1985 Super Mario Bros on the NES. Given that this was made at a time when game boxes looked like this, and the games looked like this, you wouldn't expect to see a huge variety of power-ups and abilities to choose from. But despite this, Mario had a couple of power-ups to work with, the classic Mushroom, Fire Flowers and Invincibility Stars. But did you know? that Mario's power-ups were originally going to be quite different. In an interview for the 25th anniversary of Super Mario Bros, Shigeru Miyamoto announced that originally, Mario was supposed to wield a gun as he yahooed his way around the Mushroom Kingdom, taking on Goombas and all other in-game enemies, and this would come with Mario's own shoot-em-up stages. But thankfully, Mario ended up getting the iconic Fire Flower as his power-up, and since then it's appeared in almost every Mario and Mario spin-off game released, allowing him to tear down waves after waves of Goombas along the way. But I've always wanted to know how this happens, especially underwater where by all accounts, Mario should be able to throw a flame as much as Spongebob should be able to light a campfire in a coral reef. Today, we're going to take a look at the science behind the fire, the ball, and how this all comes together to make one of the most iconic power-ups in gaming. But before we take a look at how the actual attack works, we need to look at fire, and talk about what exactly it is, and why it's so damaging. You see, fire is unique. We know it's not a solid because it doesn't have a fixed shape, it's not a liquid because it doesn't have a fixed volume, and just from that, you might assume that it's a gas. But that's not quite right either, as it doesn't expand the same way as gas does when exposed to extra energy. And as well as this, fire doesn't have any standard structure, and it needs to be fed to continue to exist, unlike any other form of matter which can just exist on its own. Whilst this might suggest that fire is just its own state of matter, there are more than just solid, liquid and gas. Some people say there are four, some say seven, and some say there are as many as 22 different states of matter in the known universe. But this includes all kind of matter you never encounter on a day-to-day -day basis, such as supercritical fluids and the sci-fi sounding time crystals. In terms of natural states of matter, we typically have four. Solid, liquids, gases, and what is known as plasma. Plasma is a form of matter past gas. It's superheated and gets so hot that electrons are ripped away from their atoms, stripping all of the atoms down to free roaming ions, forming an ionized gas. This kind of matter comprises over 99% of the known universe, stars and nebulas and the aurora borealis, and it even includes bolts of lightning and the light given off by neon signs. This makes the most sense for fire because of the presence of free roaming electrons. Okay, so now we know what the fire part of the power-up is, but this can't be all there is to it. Mario's fireballs aren't pure fire, otherwise they wouldn't have the mass needed to be affected by gravity and bounce, so there must be a core beneath the flames. At the end of the day, plasma is a state of matter that has no definite shape or mass, so it can't act like the fireballs we see. As well as this, the fireballs as we see them in game are able to burn underwater, and that's pretty tricky to pull off given that fire needs three things to survive. Fuel, oxygen and heat. This is known as the fire triangle. You can have as much fuel and heat as you like, but without that oxygen, you're never going to get a flame underwater like we see in game. And this applies for any of the three components. If one's missing, then you're not going to get any kind of flame. This is why fire blankets and fire extinguishers work for putting out fires. They take away the access of oxygen to the fire by either stopping oxygen from getting to it or injecting a high concentration of carbon dioxide into the environment near the fire and both of these stop the chemical reaction from continuing. So 
what do we need for it to work underwater? Well, that's actually pretty simple in theory. You need to use a fuel that can provide itself with oxygen. The most common example of this is thermite. Thermite is a chemical compound that's commonly used in a variety of metal welding processes and it consists of a mixture of an aluminium powder and iron oxides, otherwise known as rust, that when ignited undergoes an exothermic reduction oxidation or redox reaction. These reactions are focused around a transfer of electrons, with oxidation reactions causing the atoms to lose electrons and reduction reactions to gain electrons. An easy way to remember this is with the acronym OIL RIG. Whilst this might seem a bit backwards, you have to remember that electrons carry a negative charge, which means the atom's overall charge is reduced whenever it gains an electron. And when we look at iron oxide, we see a nice amount of oxygen surrounding the iron atoms, and these get released as the aluminium and iron react together. Looking at our iron oxide molecule, you see that the iron is connected to two oxygens. Each of the lines connecting the oxygen to the iron is representative of an ionic bond. This means that the iron is donating electrons to the oxygen, giving it a full outer shell of electrons and keeping it stable. You also see some of the oxygen atoms have two lines suggesting a double bond and two electrons being shared. This is the same for aluminium oxide because we're dealing with a metal and a non-metal. But why is aluminium able to take the oxygen from the iron? Well, when we look at iron and aluminium on an atomic level, we see that the aluminium ions are significantly smaller than the iron atoms. The oxide ions are going to have an easier time getting close to the aluminium ions compared to the ferric iron. This results in forces called electrostatic forces that stabilize the aluminium oxide more effectively than the iron oxide. When we look at chemical reactions, we're almost always able to predict how two substances will react based on the thermodynamics of a reaction. A reaction that runs hot, that's exothermic, is usually more likely to happen than an endothermic reaction. And a thermite reaction definitely falls into this category. So the aluminium is able to displace the iron from the iron oxide, removing the oxygen. The iron is reduced and the aluminium is oxidized. These oxygen atoms feed the flame, providing the reaction with energy, and keep it going, but not forever. And even if it could, the issue now is that when it's placed underwater, it may get too cool to keep burning. And to stop this, the reaction needs to be insulated to protect it from the water that surrounds it. Now, of course, this reaction also results in iron being left behind. And as the reaction finishes, the water would cool that iron into a solid lump. So, who knows, maybe the Coopers underwater aren't being killed by fire, but by jagged bits of iron giving them an unexpected trepanning. But it's worth noting that this method wouldn't work in a vacuum or a low oxygen environment, such as being underwater, as thermite would require external energy source to ignite it. And that's not really going to happen underwater, unless you have a large amount of cables to pass electrical energy through. You would need to ignite the thermite above water, then throw it under for it to work properly. As well as that, metals aren't really known for bouncing. Whenever you drop a coin, you don't expect it to bounce down a road and be lost forever. Instead, it just lands and waits for you to pick it up. Or, if you're really unlucky, it rolls away into a nearby drain pipe. This is where we need to go back to the science of portal and look at materials with a low coefficient of restitution, especially as fireballs never seem to lose height no matter how far they travel. They maintain their kinetic energy and just keep bouncing forever. But note that they never jump back to the height that they're thrown at. You can jump and throw a fireball, but it's just going to keep bouncing the height of a Goomba's head. So what we need is something that can burn in a vacuum and that can coat a capsule with a relatively low coefficient of restitution. This will allow it to burn underwater and bounce in the characteristic way we'd see in game. For these low coefficients of restitution, we want to look at different kinds of rubber. But this brings us another problem. Rubber isn't highly flammable, with an ignition temperature as high as 260 to 320 degrees Celsius. But then again, given that the thermite mixture would burn at around 2200 degrees Celsius, or roughly 4000 degrees Fahrenheit, this doesn't seem like it would be too huge an issue. When we're looking at what can burn in a vacuum, we naturally have to look to the stars and see what kind of chemicals organizations like NASA use for their rocket fuels. Solid rocket boosters are surprisingly similar to the thermite composition mentioned earlier. 
with solid rocket boosters featuring powdered aluminium as the fuel and a chemical called ammonium perchlorate as the oxidizer. Whilst most rocket fuels are liquids at room temperature, ammonium perchlorate is a solid powder which makes it ideal for our fireballs. Now all that Mario would need to do is mix these chemicals with a rubber like material to produce little balls of fire that can bounce along the mushroom kingdom. But then the problem lies with the physics of these fireballs, you see once the energy is released by the fuel the rubber container would heat up quickly and this would reduce the coefficient of restitution of the material so quickly that I honestly doubt that it would be able to bounce even once. And when underwater the energy would dissipate into the water quickly cooling down your flaming projectile to the point that it would damage whatever you were fighting but not fatally like we see in game. Though these fireballs are great for taking down Koopa and Goomba, we're ignoring the negative impact that this would have on Mario. He's throwing these burning balls of powder which are burning at 200 degrees with plain old gloves. Every time he throws one of them he's going to be risking significant burns and that's not all. These thermite flames are very bright and Mario's throwing them at eye level meaning that he could be risking retinal damage, even if he was standing a reasonable distance away. And ignoring these, the heat of the fire when thrown in the water would lead to boiling water vapour, and that would risk burning the skin really badly, as well as the molten rubber produced from the flaming fireballs that could stick to the skin and cause third degree burns, and there's not much you can do about that once it happens. So there we go. Mario's fireballs might very well be powered by rocket fuel and to use them Mario should be covered head to foot in protective gear, but how does this link to flowers? Well that's a bit trickier as it doesn't seem to be linked to chemistry or science in general. And this is only one of Mario's many power ups. At some point I'll have to make a video on its polar opposite the ice flower to see what could cause items to freeze on impact and how those extreme colds could impact Mario as well, so you can expect that video sometime down the line. As always, if you enjoyed this video then don't forget to leave a like, comment and subscribe to the channel. And if you want to help combat the ever changing and frustrating YouTube algorithm then make sure you share the video to help my channel grow. And if you have any scientific subject or topic that you'd like to see me cover in the future then please tell me in the comments down below. As well as that, follow me on Twitter to get updates on the latest science of videos and join my discord for chats about gaming, science and more. But until then, this has been the science of the fire flower. I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you're looking for game based content then you can join me over on Twitch, where I live stream 3 times a week playing all manner of games suggested by the community. Or if you want to support the channel even further then you could also contribute to my Patreon, where you'll get behind the scenes access to the creation of all videos as well as being able to vote on what the next science of video will be.